Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first session for the, this morning. Uh, this session is Lessons from a Quarter of a Billion Breached Records with your presenter, Troy Hunt. Troy is a local Gold Coaster who runs the free service Have I Been Pwned, which aggregates large data breaches and notifies impacted subscribers of their exposure. He's also an author for Pluralsight, where he creates online security courses for developers and is a Microsoft regional director and most valuable professional. Now, Troy said his presentation is going to run right down to the wire, so might hold off for questions. He said he was going to hang around after the session to take any questions. So please make Troy welcome. All right. Thanks very much, everyone. It's nice to be uh, so close to home. I had to, to walk here this morning, which is, <laughs> which is a really nice change. So uh, what I want to talk about today is a, a bunch of things that I have seen uh, as part of running this Have I Been Pwned service. And I did this talk the first time earlier this year. Uh, and this was the talk. It was 220 uh, million records. Uh, and by the second time I did it, I had to revise things upwards. And every time I've done this talk, I have to keep changing it because the landscape changes so quickly. And uh, I, I sort of had things prepared the other day. And it was like, OK, I'll just round it up. We'll just go a quarter of a billion. It's, um, it's not a quarter of a billion anymore. It, it kind of went a little bit higher during the week uh, due to one particular incident. Anyone in a data breach this week? Yeah, look, either you are or you don't know you are, because pretty much everyone was in LinkedIn, which took the total numbers of uh, individual breached accounts that I've, I've got in this system up to just over half a billion, which is kind of a crazy number. So what I want to talk about today is some of the things I've seen running this service. So some of the people I've had interactions with, uh, some of the ways that they're sending data, the way they're monetizing data, and uh, hopefully give everyone just a little bit of insight into what's actually going on behind some of these data breaches. But one of the things I find really interesting when looking at security incidents is the way hackers are represented. And we probably all see this, right? Like we see the news, there's a story about hackers in there, and we, we see some interesting patterns. One of the things about this is that hacking incidents make the news like so many other technology things just don't. It's actually mainstream consumer news. And if you have a look at the way hackers are represented, you start to see some patterns. Now, here's what stands out to me here, and you'll see this throughout the talk. It's a recurring theme. Uh, hackers have hoodies, which is one thing that's very important. Uh, <laughs> Hackers are uh, very much like binary as well, and they very much like green. And we all see this, right, in all these stock photos. And there's a certain perception which is created around the way hackers work. So it's interesting looking at things like uh, Cujo. Cujo's little Kickstarter project, it's security in a box for consumers. And uh, they have this little video. You may not know it, but you've probably already been hacked. Thousands of hacking attacks occur each day. Now, Notice how that ticks all the boxes, right? So we've got the guy in a hoodie, so we know he's a hacker. Uh, he has a green screen as well, so, you know, that's, that's good. Uh, some scary music because we've got to instill enough fear in people that stuff will go wrong, that they go and buy the security in a box because they've already been hacked even if they don't know. It. But there's a curious thing about this, and you have a look at the screen that he's typing into, and I'll, I'll zoom in on a little bit of it here, and, and there's a browser Chrome on the screen the guy is hacking on. And I, th I thought this was really curious. Like, I want to know how he does this, because I might learn something, right? And I figured it out. And here's what you do. And any of you can become a hacker by doing this as well. What you do is you go to a website called hackertyper.net. Now, you've got to put it in full screen. Otherwise, you give the game away. And then, as you type, that's what happens. This is exactly what he used in that video. I literally zoomed in, and it's exactly this code. They are selling security in a box because a guy in a hoodie typing on a green screen in a browser is hacking your things, apparently. So we have this really inconsistent representation of hackers. Now, the reality of it is, oh, did you see this one as well? This is the uh, dormant cyber pathogens. This was on the news just the other day. Uh, <laughs> this was one of, the, uh, one of the stock photos. We'll talk more about stock photos later on. Uh, notice also he does have a hoodie, so therefore we know he's a hacker. 
So, so this is the way these incidents are being represented and the way the threat actors, as we'd call them, uh, are being portrayed. And the reality is actually quite a bit different. So guys like Ryan Cleary, he was part of LulzSec, 19 years old. He's turning up at court there with his mum, who is seriously pissed. <laughs> Just, like the guy is so grounded after this, he's not going to be hacking anything for a long time. But 19 years old, and he did do a lot of damage. Uh, same with Jake Davies, he was 18 years old. And the interesting thing is, is that often these, these guys, and it's almost always guys, are either kids in the legal sense in that they're under 18, or they're kids in that they're kind of younger than all of us, so we think of them as kids. So that the reality of it is, is that the scary hackers are usually not quite as scary as the media would like to portray them. And when we actually look at what's going on behind the scenes, we realize a lot of the time, certainly with the data breaches that I see so frequently, it's kids that have a combination of curiosity and time. And that can be a really destructive combination, but it allows them to do things like this, to break into the likes of TalkTalk. Talk. Now, TalkTalk Talk was interesting. So TalkTalk Talk is a uh, UK telco. They got hacked late last year. Now, after they got hacked, this detective came out and said, uh, we think it is Russian Islamic cyber jihadis, which is a terrifying prospect for your average person because every one of those things, apologies to any Russians, sounds kind of scary, right? Russian Islamic cyber jihadi. And this is the way it was represented. And then it turned out to be a 15-year-old kid in his bedroom. I assume in his bedroom, because where else are you going to be hacking from when you're like 15 years old? You're at your parents' place, right? So that was him. There was, uh, there was another guy. He was a little bit older. He was 16. This is really old guy. He was 20. And these are the folks that broke into TalkTalk. Talk. And the interesting thing is you, you look back on, on how this happened, and it was SQL injection using SQL maps. So effectively, the 15-year-old knew how to download a free tool, and then knew how to copy and paste. And that is about the extent of the competency that he needed to get in there. And frankly, I'm a little bit sympathetic to some of them. No, they shouldn't be breaking into this sort of stuff. But when you're 15 and someone says copy and paste a link into a tool, you know, he probably had no idea of the consequences. But this is often the level of competence of the individuals breaking into these systems and then leaking this data publicly. Very often, there is actually a financial upside. There is money that they want to make out of this data. And it's curious to look at the different ways that this happens and some of the things we can learn. So I'll give you an example. I'm going to share some of the private conversations I've had, obviously anonymized. And uh, here was a case where someone said, look, um, I think for, uh, for this particular breach, Nexus Mods, I would like to receive a sum of Bitcoin. So people want to sell these data breaches. Now, for me, it's pretty easy. I have a default response, which is I'm not giving anybody any money for anything and I'm not giving anybody any sort of exchange data or anything like that. I don't want to be the one that's perpetuating either the incentive to break into these sites or perpetuating the spread of particularly data breaches which, uh, which don't go anywhere else. So there are some data breaches remain pretty self-contained, but regardless, I'm not going to be the one spreading it around. So this is a conversation which often plays out. Uh, and it, just for curiosity, so I give the same answer even to security researchers. Often security researchers will say, uh, we would really like the LinkedIn data breach because we want to do analysis and it will be all honest and just give us the hashes. It's just easier for me to say, no, nobody is getting anything because then I can, at least with all good faith, say I've never given stuff to other people. So that's my rationale on that. Looking at some of the incidents, things like IPM. So uh, this bloke said, look, I've got IPM. IPM is the Office of Personnel Management, a bunch of US government identities, about 18 million identities. I reckon it's worth more than 100 Bitcoin. Bitcoin's about 600 Aussie dollars at the moment, so 60 grand for IPM. And you can understand that because if you had 18 million individuals with a whole bunch of personal attributes, including things like social security numbers, which the Americans love to use as a verification attribute, it's going to be pretty valuable. Other times it'll be stuff like this, and this one I found quite curious. So this was after Triple O Webhost, which is one of these sort of freemium hosting providers. So they got hacked last year. They had 13 million accounts with plain text passwords hacked. Took me about a week, 
couldn't get in touch with them, kept going through their support lines and they didn't want to escalate it and they basically, uh, basically didn't want to pay much attention to it. Eventually, the news comes out, goes public. And this person contacted me. And what I found really curious about this, this was someone trading in the data. He says, the database is private and it's better kept that way. Now his definition is private, of private, is that a bunch of us have got it and we're sharing it between each other. And it's ours. Yeah, okay, we did hack it <laughs> at a triple web host, but now it's ours. And uh, I'm not real keen on the fact that it's now public knowledge. Now he went on to say, I can't understand which moron would be considering giving you a copy for free because they want to sell it. And the problem that these guys have is that once these incidents become public, whether it's in the press or searchable and have I been pined or whatever it is, the value goes down. So in a case like this, uh, he said the database is selling upwards of two grand, which is conceivable, 13 million accounts, plain text credentials. There was a site which had it publicly listed. This is a clear website. Down the bottom left, they had it listed for one and a half thousand dollars. Similar sort of range, I guess, to two grand. After all the news went public and a little bit of time went by and the data started to spread, the price drops. Because there are so many people who have these accounts that are now changing their passwords and are now no longer exploitable by the people that have these original data breaches, the value drops. And I find that really interesting. And as much as we don't want websites getting hacked, once they do this sort of early notification and letting everyone know that yes, you're at risk, and you probably want to go and change that password that you've reused everywhere on everything ASAP, there's less people to exploit. Value goes down. Often I see headlines like this. So this was only last month, a couple of months ago. And uh, obviously someone's broken into a porn network here. And there's a comment from the guy. So this was the hacker. I want to publicly shame them. All right, maybe it's kind of a little bit altruistic. He wants to put them on notice, hey, you've done something bad, you deserve to have your name drawn through the mud for that. And it, it was almost sort of represented as though he's, he's doing this for the good of society, says the guy who's selling the data. <laughs> so there is very often a financial upside for these guys. They want to monetize the information that they've stolen or that they've traded with someone else. Now, a lot of people sort of say, okay, well, like, where does this come from? How hard is it to obtain this data? Am I sort of spending all day trawling around the dark webs? Now, how do I find this information? And the reality of it is, it, it comes from a variety of different sources. And now that this service has been running for a little while, there's enough people that follow it and support it. Many of them who sort of travel in these circles where they're trading data, uh, who come to me and say, look, such and such has been hacked, I'd like to send you the data. So I get messages like this. So this was the person who sent me the AAA web host data. This was the, uh, the original email from him. And there's sort of a couple of interesting things here. So one is that very often what these guys do is once they have the data, they'll upload it to a service like Mega. So there's no authorization or anything around how you access this data. It's just a great big long obfuscated link. They'll send it over and go, here it is. Uh, this guy with the benefit of hindsight may not have been so bright because he said, uh, I'm going to give you 2 million out of the 13 million database. The 13 million database of so 13 million individuals is a bit secret. I don't want to share it. Uh, he, he did accidentally upload the 13 million record one. So maybe not paying a lot of attention there. But the interesting thing about this particular guy, so you know, the data went out there, it got press, it had lots of headlines. Uh, he then got really, really nervous afterwards. He sent me this. And what struck me when I read this is how much it sounds like a kid. It sounds like someone who has not thought through the ramifications of what they've got themselves involved in. And it, it kind of speaks to that point earlier on about a lot of the time, these are legally minors or very young people who really haven't considered the social consequences of what they're doing. Other times we'll see things like this. Now this is an interesting one. So someone reached out I think it was last year, and said, uh, I've got some data for you from a Dutch financial institution. And particularly once it's, once it's dealing with money and there is serious ramifications on people, it all gets very delicate. I tend to not try and ask too much about, did you go in and hack it or did you get it from someone else? 
But when they literally send you a screen cap of SQL map where they have extracted the data out themselves, it, like the ambiguity goes away. Uh, note also uh, green. He did actually put his screen into green before he started. For anyone looking at this and going, look, I've been doing it wrong, I really need to go green, uh, if you do jump into a command window, it's just a little bit of colour A and you'll be good to hack. Uh, so that's what most of these guys <laughs> appear to be doing. Now, in this actual case, I end up getting in touch with the organisation. There are a lot of data breaches you never see on Have I Been Pwned that stay quiet for various reasons. In this case, I got in touch with the organisation. Uh, this was something which didn't seem to have spread very far. Uh, they managed to deal with it all internally. It's a listed company dealing with uh, very, very sensitive financial information. So they kind of cleaned up a little bit quietly. Uh, oddly enough, though, after that, I've since had multiple people reach out and say, by the way, would you like XYZ data? So even when you think these things are contained, once it sort of spreads just that little bit far enough, it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. There are a lot of clear websites springing up that also trade in this data. This is one which is accessible without jumping onto Tor. And here's an interesting thing as well. Often you see the news and they go, oh yeah, look, this data is out there, it's being traded, but, uh, but it's on the dark web. And it's almost like that makes it harder to access. The sort of guy, <laughs> most of you probably know, jumping on the Tor is not a particularly difficult thing. You download the Tor browser bundle or you go to web to Tor and it's, for all intents and purposes, the barrier to entry is a fraction higher than clear web. But be that as it may, this is on the clear web. This is a site that frequently posts data breaches uh, in full. You can see here, they've actually got AAA web host on there as well. So sometimes it's very, very easy to obtain these breaches. This was LinkedIn. So this is obviously very topical. This was just last week. You've probably all seen the news on LinkedIn. This site is uh, a Tor-based website. It's called The Real Deal. They, uh, they have the LinkedIn data there. And this was sort of the first place it appeared. 167 million records with uh, email addresses and SHA-1 hashes of passwords with no salt. About 90% of those have been cracked already, so for all intents and purposes, it's just about clear text. They're on there selling for five Bitcoin a pop. They're actually down to two Bitcoin, at least as of yesterday. So their price is now dropping as the data is spreading and people are changing passwords. Interesting thing though, on a site like this, so this is a, a dark web trading site, is to have a look at the classes of commodity that data breaches sit next to. We've got drugs there on the right, on the left you can see we've got weapons, all sorts of other things that somehow this class of data, which is data breaches, are now sort of sitting in there. It's like, yeah, uh, guns, drugs and data breaches, all being traded in the same place. So the point is, is that this data comes from a number of different places. There's no sort of one tried and trusted, this is the way it always comes kind of channel. One of the things though that I'm really, really conscious of uh, when there are incidents where someone pops up and says, you know, hey, look, I've got a bit of data for you, is that very often it's fake. So you might have seen in the news probably about four weeks ago, it's a big story said uh, something like 272 million accounts hacked out of Gmail, Hotmail, MailRU. And the, the press went apeshit about it because it's a good story, right? It is a really, really good story. Reuters broke it very early on. Another security researcher had gotten in touch with them. They found this on the dark web, serious stuff. And by the time the likes of Google and Microsoft actually looked at it, they said, yeah, there's like a fraction of 1% of accounts that are actually legitimate. It was fake. Not necessarily saying the guy who reported it made, made the whole thing up, but he could have got it from someone else who fabricated it. So verification is really important. And I'll show you a couple of different ways I verify these things. So I'll give you one good example. Uh, last week, adult, or last year, adult friend finder got hacked. Now, if you're seeing friend and you're thinking, well, maybe this is a social network. Friend means something quite different <laughs> in this context. The thing is though, when there's a breach like this, and look, I mean, this is obvious, it's pretty self-explanatory, right? It's a hookup site. Sites like this, people sign up to and they have an expectation of privacy. They don't want their wife to find out that they're on there. And if we put our moral judgment aside for a moment, that's probably a reasonable expectation. But pretty much every time, there is an enumeration risk where you can go in and literally just fat finger the keyboard. Uh, you may have to solve a super, super safe capture. Uh, and you'll be told pretty quickly that it's invalid. 
And guess what happens if you put in a correct email address? Yeah, it's valid. It exists. So most of these sites have enumeration risks. And what that means is I can look at a data breach, grab several Mailinator accounts out of it. So if you never use Mailinator, you can send an email address to anything you like at mailinator.com and then go to Mailinator and look at the mailbox. It's basically a public open mailbox for disposable accounts. If someone's signing up with a Mailinator account, they have no expectation of privacy. It's not real. They're just trying to gain access through whatever entry criteria there are. So I can grab several of those. And if they return positive matches, you're pretty sure that the data is going to be legit. It's one indicator. It's not exhaustive. Someone could have seeded it with Mailinator accounts. Now, often, it's a very explicit enumeration risk like that. No, it doesn't exist. Yes, it does. Other times, it's more like what Ashley Madison was doing, where they had on their password reset page a situation where you could jump in like this with uh, an invalid email address, so you just fat finger something up, and they'll come back and give you a message like this. And when you look at this, there's, there's like a ray of hope. If that email address exists in our database, you'll receive an email. And you kind of read that and go, well, if it doesn't exist, maybe I won't. But it's not telling you, right? So it's not giving that explicit confirmation whether the account exists or not. So I created a, a research account. Um, I've, <laughs> I've had to explain to my wife many times how many research accounts I have. And uh, <laughs> created a research account, did a password reset, and I got this message. Do you see any disparity between the results? So it's an implicit enumeration risk. So it's telling you that they don't have an account, but it's not quite telling you black and white like Adult Friend Finder does. So that's one really easy way. Most websites will do this, if not on password reset. Many of them will do it on login. Many of them will do it on registration. Many of them will do it as a mechanism of brute force protection because they will lock out an account that exists after three or five failed attempts, but they won't lock out an account that doesn't exist. More recently, I've been using this approach. So I've got approaching half a million subscribers on Have I Been Pwned. It's a free thing. You just go in, put in your email address, you verify it, you get an email with a nonce in it, and go, yes, I did actually want to be on here. And now, often when a data breach comes up, I'm saying, OK, well, let's find which of my subscribers, so people that have entrusted me with looking for where they're exposed, which of my ones are in there? And I'll grab maybe 20 of the most recent people who've signed up, so it's still kind of front of mind. And I'll say, look, uh, your name's come up in a breach. Would you be happy to help verify it? And usually they say yes. I actually, I've had not had anyone say no. I've, I'm sure a lot of the time the mail just goes to spam. But uh, certainly everyone that's replied has gone, yes, I'm interested. I mean, that's why they've signed up, right? So I'll send them a little bit of data. Send them something like this. You know, nothing too sensitive. Uh, something like, you know, when did you log in? Uh, what's your location? Who's your ISP based on the IP address? This lady, very unfortunately for her, was also on TalkTalk. Talk. And she's like, oh, geez, I just had TalkTalk, Talk, and now I've got this one. Uh, so unfortunately, many people do see themselves over and over again. Anyway, in this case, she came back and said, yes, in this case it was VTech. I did actually register on there. So now you've sort of got this confirmation from the person who was on the site that they existed. I did this recently with the Philippines Election Commission breach. 55 million people in this breach. That's half of the entire population. And one of the guys actually sent me like two characters out of his passport as well, because a lot of passport data was leaked. So it's not just them sort of having some kind of confirmation bias. They're actually providing a secret that only they'd know. So that's verification. I find the way companies respond is, is also interesting. And I think we can sort of draw a lot from their priorities when we look at what they say after a breach happens. So if we look at uh, Avid Life Media, parent company of Ashley Madison. So we had over 30 million people hacked out of Ashley Madison. Now, again, it's an affairs site, right? It's there to commit adultery. These people are worried that their life is going to be destroyed. Their wife's going to leave, and they're never going to see their kids again. And the first thing that Avid Life Media tells them is, hey, good news, your credit card's all right. You know? And the guy's going, I don't give a shit about my credit card. Like, if my credit card's owned, my bank will give me fraud protection. I'll get a new card in the mail. Like, the worst thing that will happen is I've got to go and change my direct debits, which, yes, is painful, but less so than your wife leaving you. But that is what they focus on. Same again with VTech. VTech lost a whole bunch of kids' data. 
the first thing they focused on was your credit card is okay. Now, why do you reckon they do this? Why is this the focus, credit cards? Everyone's whispering to PCI. This is what they're worried about because there is retribution from PCI. They want to be able to continue to take payments, which is understandable, but that seems to be the first thing they focus on a lot of the time, rather than focusing on the fact that there's actually a really serious human impact, particularly for something like Ashley Madison. People killed themselves as a result of Ashley Madison. This one was a little bit unique. This was uh, only about last month. This is a Minecraft site. They had seven million accounts hacked out of their site and they knew about it and didn't tell anyone until someone sent it to me and eventually it got airtime. And this was their reasoning. And they weren't really sure of why this was not a good thing. Now, after this went out, the number of people that popped up and said, well, hang on a second, I've used this email address everywhere, this password everywhere. And this is the problem because these credentials are exploited in other locations. And these guys just had no idea of the ramifications downstream to other services. In fact, what they did is they forced a password reset so that when you next logged onto their service, you had to change it. Now, of course, this was after you logged on as well. So if someone had the credentials, they would have logged on and they would have done whatever you can do with a Minecraft site. Or you could log onto someone's Gmail or their social media or all these other places where the credentials are reused. So often these sites don't think about the downstream ramifications. We've seen this from LinkedIn as well. There's a lot of weirdness about who LinkedIn has notified about who was in the data breach. And there's a lot of people who had changed their passwords shortly after LinkedIn was originally hacked in 2012 on LinkedIn, but they haven't changed it anywhere else. But LinkedIn may not have sent them a notification because they said, well, you changed it on our service. Do you really need to know? Now, I find the, the way the press covers a lot of this really interesting. There's a lot we can learn by looking at the way the press covers data breaches. And if we look at LinkedIn last week, this was sort of a follow-up story. So Lorenzo from Vice, who does uh, Motherboard here, he often writes a lot about these incidents, often gets very early stories. He's one of the guys I often work with when something comes up and he says, look, can you see if this is legit or not? Uh, so he sort of broke this story about LinkedIn originally. And then you had this follow-up story a week ago. All right, so this is precisely what I was just talking about. So accounts from LinkedIn having password reuse and then other things being hacked. So people's Twitter accounts being taken over. So he wrote this story, which is okay, that's fine. And then on the real deal dark market site selling the data, they used his story in the description in order to give authenticity to the data. So it's almost like they leveraged the press. And we saw it with the guy earlier on. Yes, I'm doing this to make them aware of the issues. By the way, the data's for sale. So they leverage the press in a way that works in their favor. Now, it's, it's also interesting to look at the sort of stories that the press will cover, because sometimes there are incidents which are a lot smaller, but due to their nature, the press picks them up and covers them. There was this one recently. And I've got to be honest, I never expected to see my name in a story with a headline like this. For, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the term, wait till you get home before you Google it. Get a very stiff drink before you start looking for it. This is what it was. So um, the fisting site. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way to sugarcoat it. This was 100,000 records, which in the scheme of data breaches is not a lot, but it is a really salacious story. So it gets picked up and it gets covered. But one of the things that I found amusing about this, as amusing as a story about this can be, is the press always has to find stock photos. <laughs> right? And I'm looking at these photos, and they're, they're fairly predictable rubber glove style photos. But I think the prize of the best stock photo of probably all time has to go to the register. <laughs> and then uh, my mum's like, so I, I saw you in the news the other day, what was it about? <laughs> I want to get off the internet. <laughs> so, uh, so that was uh, a bit unprecedented this year. <laughs> so, 
Moving on to something a little bit more serious. One side of all of this is obviously going to be law enforcement. So yeah, how, how are these data breaches perceived, how are they dealt with, and, and in particular, how do individuals involved in these sorts of exercises view law enforcement? And that it sort of dawned on me, particularly over the last year, that there is, there is a perception that many people have about law enforcement, which at least in my experience is inconsistent with the reality. And certainly every time I've spoken to law enforcement here or overseas, everything has been very constructive with everybody having the same objective. We're just trying to make the web a safer place, trying to stop people from getting abused and taken advantage of. But time and time again, I hear from people, particularly people who find breaches, and let's just sort of, sus or rather find vulnerabilities, let's just suspend judgment for a moment in terms of how they go about finding that there might be a SQL injection risk, for example. Maybe they're Irish and they put in O'Reilly and the thing just spat the dummy. Maybe they were being a little bit more creative. But they found a vulnerability and very often they'll say, I don't want to report this because I see the headlines and it's security researcher goes to jail. But the interesting thing is, in pretty much every case I can think of, when we see a headline like this, there's a bigger story. Anyone know who this is? You probably don't want to know who he is. Uh, that's another timeline you wait till you get home and you have a stiff drink before you look at. Andrew Oppenheimer, also known as Weave, he found a direct object reference risk in AT&T with the iPad registration process, uh, I think about 2011, or some years ago now. And uh, basically what he found was he could look at a URL, change a number, and pull back someone else's data. This is the nature of direct object reference risks. And then just to make sure it wasn't an accident, he did it another 114,000 times. Uh, and, and then gave all the data to the press and people are like, oh, security researcher arrested, this sucks. Yeah, but look at what he actually did. There is normally a story where they have gone well beyond just the discovery of a risk. This guy's in the news just recently, Dave Levin, the bloke on the left in the black, in black uh, shirt. By all accounts, a very nice guy. I had a bit of a chat to him afterwards. And uh, he was in the news. He was arrested because he found this hole in, a, in an election site there in one of the local counties in the US. But what happened with Dave, and I, I think quite frankly all of this was pretty political because the bloke on his left is campaigning for a particular seat and it was just very coincidental that he somehow found a SQL injection risk on the site. So he found this SQL injection risk and then he fired up Havage, which is a pretty Mickey Mouse SQL injection tool, whacked the URL in, sucked out all the data, including the plain text credentials to authenticate to the admin interfaces, logged on to the admin interface with the plain text credentials, videoed the whole thing, put it on YouTube, and wouldn't you believe it, he got arrested. You know, like, th th this is the story behind that. If it had been he found the risk and he contacted them and he got arrested, that would be a very different story. But it is normally someone going well beyond just, I have found a risk. So in that context of law enforcement, I think this is really important, where we want people, when they identify vulnerabilities, to have channels where they can disclose ethically, and obviously things like bug bounties are getting a lot of traction these days, but not to be fearful of going to jail just for finding a risk, because usually there's a much bigger story behind it. So sort of thinking about how we can, how we can try and fix all this. And none of it is an easy problem, but there's a few things that really stick out to me looking at these incidents time and time again. And one of them is we've got to get really early notification. So that lifeboat example was, was probably at one bad end of the extreme. It took months. And in fact, it was a conscious decision not to tell anyone. If the data hadn't been given to me, I don't know how long it would have taken before people actually realized. Even with the likes of Forbes, so Forbes got hacked. They had about a million accounts leaked a couple of years ago. They took about a week before they let people know. I mentioned Philippines Election Commission the other day. 55 million accounts floating around there on the web. They still refuse to acknowledge that that data came out of their system. They acknowledge they got hacked because their entire site got defaced, so they can't really deny that. But they're not reaching out to people and saying, hey, very soon after the event, all your stuff just got leaked. You now need to think about where you need to change your password. Possibly change your passport, given the data they leaked. We're heading in this direction for us. We'll get mandatory disclosure. And it may be a bit vague, and it may take several iterations to, 
get it, I was going to say right, I don't know that we'll ever get it right, but get it better. But we've got to get to this point because the premise that people can have their data out there doing the rounds, being traded and sold and exploited, and the company try to cover it up, is just hard to fathom because we've seen throughout this talk about how many places it gets reused and abused. And the final one, and this is probably a little bit contentious, and a lot of companies don't like this, but if you lose someone's data, I reckon you've got to tell them what it was. I'll give you a good example. This week, LinkedIn. So I keep hearing from people, I want to know what my password was on LinkedIn. Now, I've, again, I've got this sort of blanket thing where I'm not giving anybody anything in terms of whether it be the entire breach or whether someone comes and says, please give me personal attributes. Like, I'm not your personal data lookup person to trawl through breaches. And in fact, to several of them, I said, look, I understand you want to know what your password was because you want to know where you've reused it. You shouldn't have reused it, but you want to know. And it was four years ago too, so it's hard to remember. And in fact, several of them went back to LinkedIn and they said, can you please give me the data? And LinkedIn said, well, no, we don't have it. You changed your password since then. We don't have the original one. And I'm going, hang on a second. <laughs> There's all these people all over the web who have 167 million of your records. The data is there. You guys should have to give it to them. Same thing happened a lot with Ashley Madison because people wanted to know, could I possibly be identified? Were my payment records there? Did I have my address on there? These people are really scared about severe consequences to their life. They want to know what was leaked. I would love to see providing data to victims being part of what goes into things like mandatory disclosure laws. You've got to tell them what happened. One final thing. Out of curiosity, who here is primarily a security pro? Show of hands. Who here is primarily a developer? Ooh, just a few. Okay, cool. So, speaking mostly to the security pros. A friend of mine sent me this the other day. And this is often what it feels like. You laugh, but I think some of you may have been on horseback riding down the mountain with a big sword. And I see this very, very frequently. Uh, and I think it's, it's a little bit of, bit of fault on all sides. We've got a lot of developers doing, quite frankly, a lot of stupid things, uh, often just due to lack of education and the rest of it. We've also got a lot of security pros often telling them that they're doing stupid things, now go and fix it and you're on your own. And that there needs to be some point in the middle where everyone gets together and says, look, ultimately we're all here to try and deliver working secure software. Like that is our grander objective, if you like. You know, how are we going to make that happen? And I would love to see more engagement between everyone because developers genuinely love getting involved in security when they get given the opportunity. So I do a lot of workshops with developers and they see SQL injection. They go, oh, this is amazing. This is so cool. Like, I was always doing the code to stop it from happening, but I never knew how it works. They, say, they see uh, things like the pineapple. Darren was talking about the other day. And they're like, this is amazing. I want one of these. And they get really engaged. And for those of you that are security pros, you've got this opportunity to sort of take them on that journey and get them excited about security. And just about every vulnerability we see exploited in order to get these data breaches are mistakes that developers have made, that you guys can help them fix. So if there's sort of a positive note to leave things on, that's what I'd love to see more of. All of us trying to help the developers on this path and giving them something that they can enjoy doing that makes everyone a lot safer. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I know I'm out of time. If anyone wants to come and see me afterwards, I'll hang around for a bit. <laughs>